Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, so the topic today, we're, we've got some sort of um, lessons learned that I'd like to share with everyone um, from my experience being an enterprise architect for many years. So we're sort of talking about these as six secrets. So there's sort of six different things that I'd like to pass on to each of you. Um, as Simon said, drop any questions you have along the way in the Q&A um, panel and then I, if I see them come along on the way, we'll sort of see how many there are, I can potentially answer them along the way or obviously Simon will read them at the end and we can go through as many of them as we can. Um, anyway, let's get started. So um, a little bit about myself. So I've been involved in some pretty big projects, um, indeed some multi-billion dollar transformations that have used um, enterprise architecture as the key foundation for how those transformations were going to deliver. Um, I'm also a research fellow, so Simon mentioned how I'm a, one of the founders of Evolution Software, but I'm also a research fellow at a university in Australia. I'm based in the UK, in Oxford though, um, so I work with mostly European companies. Um, I've been involved with the Open Group for many years. Um, I've been involved in the Architecture Forum and the Archimate Forum, so I've certainly um, got a lot of experience with the different standards there, written lots of papers. Um, and I'm also, um, you can see that link at the bottom of the slide there, I'm also the enterprise architecture blogger for InfoWorld. So I'd encourage you all to go and have a look at that um, blog. There's lots of different um, topics and articles there. Indeed, this slide deck is something that's come out of one of the posts I did there about maybe, maybe a year ago now. Um, and yeah, it was one of the most popular blogs in InfoWorld's um, catalogue of, of, of blogs. So yeah, I thought it was a topic that was well worth um, repeating and bringing into a, um, a more sort of detailed, fleshed out presentation, which is obviously the what I'm going to go through today. Okay, so let me share some secrets with you. Um, as I said, all born out of the, the experience I have um, from many years in this field. So secret number one, um, what we're looking at here is that Top enterprise architects know what just enough architecture looks like. It's a phrase that we've certainly heard, you know, just in time and all that. It's a, it's a pretty common sort of phrase you've heard people say, but in our context, it's just enough, you know, just enough architecture. What does it look like? They certainly don't try to boil the ocean. Um, good enterprise architects, you know, know what the question is and then frame their answers um, in the context of that question. So just enough architecture. Now, the strange thing about just enough architecture is invariably we're pretty good at saying what too much architecture looks like. And indeed, often what we find when we start to look at, you know, in inverted commas, what people might call best practice. And to be fair, this is probably something that was, was kind of around turn of the century, you know, when, um, you know, enterprise architecture was really getting its popularity through um, compliance things like Sarbanes-Oxley and Baal II, you know, various regulatory demand for having enterprise architecture or an organisation to have um, you know, captured their enterprise architecture. What often happened then was people chose you know, their favourite framework, you know, so whether it was um, you know, Zachman on the left there, um, you know, that was obviously something that's been popular for many years. And I suspect no one recognises the one on the right. I guess it's, it's a bit difficult to, to have the interactivity with you, but if anyone feels like firing it into the, the Q&A, um, you know, in, in the Q&A window, if they recognise what that one is on the right, you know, we'll give you a gold star later. It's actually the one from Microsoft. And so if you think that, you know, Zachman might be a little bit too complicated, well, actually the Microsoft one um, has a lot more cells and a lot more content than even Zachman. So you're talking, you know, best part of 120 different cells. And of course you can't read the, the font that's in there, but even within each of those cells or perspectives, you had many different views you could take. So there was well over um, 200 different ways you could describe an architecture. Now it's being a little bit, disingenuous to Microsoft. This was something that was part of their um, certification program, you know, if you wanted to be a certified architect back around the turn of the century. Um, it's since actually been um, decommissioned, so, so it's not something that's um, been pushed through with Microsoft, I mean, whether that's because it was too complicated or not. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the end um, point here or the bottom line here is Oftentimes people would take these big frameworks and they would start to fill them in. And you know, dare I say, no one's doing that now, I hope. Um, so let's see. Um, okay, um, what does it lead to? It often leads to, um, I guess, what people might affectionately call wallpaper. 
you know, when I walk into into a new client, um, I'm quite often looking at you know their, their walls in their boardroom or in their meeting room, and you know they'll always have some big A0 plots, you know, some sort of nice artwork there of things that might describe their enterprise. So absolutely, we'd recognise these sort of things as a big entity relationship diagram. That's an interface diagram. You know, there's a systems diagram. So really what we're looking at here is just different ways, unfortunately, that people have gone to too much detail. So back to that secret that we talk about, just enough architecture. This is clearly too much architecture. Um, when you look at the bottom right hand corner of these types of views, you look at the title block there and you look at the date of when this thing was last um, maintained or last edited, you'll often find it many years in the past. Um, so absolutely, this is not just enough architecture. This is you know, definitely diagrams for diagrams sake. So just one example of what could be a, a good example of just enough architecture. This is a dashboard. It's a, it's a KPI dashboard. It's using um, a product, uh, you know, a business intelligence product. It's essentially showing you different areas. It's got different types of views here. There's a tree map there. There's obviously a bar chart. Um, there's a hierarchical pie chart, which is usually called a sunburst chart. So there's different views here that you could use to describe an enterprise. And the most important thing, which I'm sure you can all see there, is there is no box and line diagram there. You know, there is no interface diagram. There is nothing. You know, it is just literally, you know, obviously the tree map is boxes within boxes. You know, a pie chart is wedges within wedges. So these are different ways that you could start to communicate architecture over and above, or certainly in a more palatable way than the big death by diagram approach. Okay, so that's the first thing. The first secret is really think carefully about how you're going to present the findings of the piece of work you've done. You know, it's not necessarily going to be a big A0 plot you stick on the wall. Okay, most successful architects I've seen have an interactive, immersive presentation. You know, they work with their stakeholders to come up with answers to the questions that they've asked and present the results in a way that's very palatable to them, not just a big interface diagram or some big landscape diagram. Okay. Let's move on to the, the second of the secrets. Okay, so secret number two, um, top enterprise architects access and use data quickly. Now, what does quickly mean? I mean, obviously time is a, is a relative thing. Um, it really depends on the complexity of the analysis piece that you're looking at. Okay, now of course you've got sort of you know, confidence levels that come in here. So needless to say, if it's a critical, you know, bet the, bet the, the farm type of piece, it's going to take a bit longer to get an answer than if it's a you know, more throwaway, less critical decision that's being um, looked at. But absolutely, within the context of whatever the scope of the question is you're trying to answer, you need to be responsive. You need to be able to get answers very quickly. So the best enterprise architects are responsive. Okay, they can join a new business, they can be asked a new question, and they absolutely should be producing insight and producing findings within a matter of weeks. Okay, the days of you know having a six-month window to go and you know, do some deep dive and come back with your answer is, is certainly not there anymore. If you can't give an answer, I mean Gartner talk about this as time to value. You know, if you can't give an answer in a very short period of time your uh, tenure as an enterprise architect is a little bit in risk. Okay, now, does that sound like a pipe dream? Um, I can assure you it's not. I've seen successful enterprise architects deliver things in, yeah, absolutely days, weeks, and certainly at worst case, months. Okay, now how do you do that? Well, it's not square pegs into round holes. Okay, the best way to be responsive, the best way to de deliver value quickly is to adapt the way you're working to the information or the data that you have at hand. Okay, so certainly don't try to force an organisation into a rigid methodology or a rigid repository or a rigid way of thinking. Adapt the methodology, and you'll know TOGAF, the, you know, the first stages of TOGAF are all about you know, configure and adapt to whatever the questions are at hand. So be very adaptable, be very configurable, be very agile to understand what the question is you have and then work very quickly to build your answer within the context of the information you have to hand. And again, that may sound difficult and I know this is where we start getting into all these great questions and we always refer to these as you know, kind of questions too painful to ask. So obviously, should we be choosing out between TOGAF versus Archimate? 
I mean, is that absolutely the, the level of um, sort of analysis that we should be doing? Do we have to pick one or the other? Um, or can you make a hybrid where you're leveraging the best aspects of different frameworks, you know, the TOGAFs and the Archimates, with some other things like maybe ITIL, maybe a business capability modeling. Um, I, I'm presuming a lot of you know um, in Archimate 3, um, which is a, a framework that, that we support, um, there is a whole concept of capability now. So that's something that Archimates just brought to the table, a capability modeling. It's been in TOGAF um, since day one, so certainly it's very mature in TOGAF, but I mean, Archimates paying a bit of a catch up there, but so absolutely, you know, do you now use the native capability modeling aspects of TOGAF or Archimate, or do you bring in something like business capability modeling? If you're in a particular industry, okay, do you just accept that you're going to use an industry aligned framework for the business architecture portion? Okay, now that's all where you start talking reference content. Okay, so you may still use TOGAF or Archimate's capability concept, but you'll seed it with content from a reference model like BN for the you know, banking and insurance industry or ETOM for telecom. Um, you know, there's various ones. Even the Open Group has different reference models for mining and things like that too. So, so absolutely, remember, adapt your model to the data or the, your answers and your questions to the data you have at hand. Don't just force things into, um, into the one way of doing things. And again, I might get shot down here, but absolutely, um, you've got all the OMG standards as well. Okay, so there's things like business process modeling notation and business motivation modeling, SysML, UML. So there's other approaches as well that may be appropriate to how you're doing things. Okay. Now, I guess one of the big questions here, and I've talked about adapting to things, one of the biggest um, challenges you have as an architect is making this decision and choosing the right starting point, accepting full well you can change over time, but certainly the first step is an important one. So when we've looked at that, we've looked at the different approaches that there are, and we, we talk about this as a Goldilocks zone. So you, we have done assessments, and I've got some um, pretty good insight into the most appropriate types of frameworks depending on the sort of question that you're trying to ask or answer. Um, what we found is that anywhere between about 30 and 50 entities or objects is enough and you should have a similar number of relationships as you has entities, okay? We talk about that as a balanced meta model, okay? So that Goldilocks zone there is on the, you know, the, the main diagonal, the Y equals X line, and that line there, the balanced line, is absolutely the place where we find most of the, um, the appropriate frameworks sitting, okay? Um, now, when we start to look at this, of course, there's other different areas here. As you can imagine with these things, there's kind of like a bottom right, a top left, and all that kind of stuff. So if we look at the bottom right here, we talk about that as an overloaded area. Now, it's not to say that the frameworks that sit down there are not appropriate. It just should be appreciated that they're pretty entity heavy. You know, they're object centric or you know, component centric. Okay, they have more entity or object types than they have relationship types, okay? And conversely, there's ones that we've seen that are over precise. Okay, so these are ones that have, you know, disproportionately more relationships than they have entities. So you're talking about multiple types of relationships between the same objects. Okay, so if we start doing a bit of a, you know, throwing our darts at this dartboard and start looking at where the different frameworks sit, yep, TOGAF firmly sits in, in that Goldilocks zone. It's a pretty balanced framework, it has about 35. Um, from memory entities and relationship types. So, so that's a pretty good balanced one and we've certainly seen it being used for you know, tens of years. It's, it's very, very fit for purpose. Um, there's some simpler ones. So there's a PF framework, okay? It's a more pragmatic one. You can see it's still on the balanced um, axis, but it's just simpler. And obviously by the word pragmatic in it, it you'd expect that to be the case. Okay, there's things like business motivation model from the OMG. It's a very specific domain. You know, it's, per, it's purely strategic modeling. So, of course, you wouldn't expect it to be as complicated as something like TOGAF or, you know, as, as, as rich as one of those things. But it's very fit for purpose in its small domain. So, it only has about 10 entities and 10 relationships. So, absolutely, it's fine though. Um, business process modeling notation. Um, what, it is starting to get a little overloaded. Okay, and even what I'm showing here is a bit of a kind of simplified version of BPMN that we normally recommend to people. Um, the full-blown BPMN has a huge complexity of things. Okay, it has you know ten different types of entities, and um, I can't remember you know it's not too many relationships, but it's a really overloaded. It has you know ten types of start events, and ten types of end events. So certainly it can get overly complicated. 
UML, not surprisingly, again, it's you know out of the OMG, and the O in OMG stands for object. You know, so of course it's a bit object centric. It has a you know disproportionate number of entities to relationships, and yeah, Archimate as well. So Archimate certainly has um, some sort of traceability back to to the OMG way of thinking and the UML way of thinking. So it's a bit object centric. You know, it, it definitely only has about I think, 10 or 11 relationship types, but it's got I don't know maybe 40 odd um, entity types now. So it's quite an overloaded framework. And then on the other side of things, you've got some of the defence frameworks. So MODAF here in the UK, we found to be a very over precise. There's many types of relationships between the same object types. It's also quite complicated. You can see in terms of the number of entity types it has, it's quite high as well. But yeah, it's, it's pushing 100 relationship types. It's, it's quite impressive in, in that regard. Okay, so like I say, when you're thinking about adapting to the data, don't just pick one framework and then mash everything into it. Think carefully about making a bit of a hybrid that's addressing the different issues that you've got to hand and the questions you're trying to answer. Now, beware the Franken model. I think that's a, I'm sure we can all imagine what that is. Just because you've stuck, you know, the left, your, your left arm is TOGAF, your right arm is Archimate, your left leg is BPMN, your right leg is UML, and your torso is, I don't know, PF or something like that. Be very careful. These things will not necessarily all work together. They will overlap each other. And the intersections or the unions between these different frameworks need to be managed very carefully. You know, if one stakeholder group wants to be working in an environment that's, you know, let's say Archimate, they need to work seamlessly with another stakeholder group that might be using something like BPMN. Okay, now those two frameworks overlap. So we've got a lot of experience of merging or mashing these frameworks together to make them fit for purpose. But you know, accept that that's okay. You can do that, but you've got to be careful that you can't just you know, load up the Christmas tree with too many decorations and keep every stakeholder happy. There has to be some consolidation there or you'll lose that line of sight from your left to right, um, top to bottom. Because yeah, we, we've got experience. There is hybrid approaches that work. Um, certainly don't be afraid of, of choosing several frameworks and, and mashing them together. That's been done hundreds of times before. Um, we can give you some good guidance on that. That intersection is pretty well known. Um, and we've got some pretty good um, off-the-shelf hybrids already, you know, where you use you know, one framework with another framework. We've got some pretty good combinations of those things. The basic rules definitely being you know, reuse, don't roll your own. You know, there's, there's no need for you to reinvent the wheel. Um, there's hundreds of frameworks out there already, I assure you. So there's no need to, to roll your own. You should absolutely be able to use something. Something will be close enough and then tweak it and change it a little bit. Okay. Um, now, I would advocate that um, you always still be careful about this. You know, sometimes it is better to use an off-the-shelf one and, and just stick with it, but tweak it a little bit. But absolutely, you should expect or accept that it's possible to change these things. So don't just be fixated on using one framework and then filling it in, you know, left to right, top to bottom, like we saw with the Zachman or or that Microsoft one. You know, be a bit more adaptable and adapt your approach to what information you have to hand. Okay. Let's move on to the third secret. So secret number three: top enterprise architects are comfortable with uncertainty. Okay. So what do I mean by that? Basically, um, there's a lot of sort of little one-liners here. Is you know, I can give you the wrong answer to five decimal places. You know, don't confuse precision with accuracy. Okay, so you've got to be comfortable though that you're kind of doing good enough. We talked about just enough architecture in that first secret, secret number one. You have to be. Um, yeah, comfortable with uncertainty. You have to be able to make a recommendation, but then say, look, you know, it is only you know 80% plus minus 10%. You know, you've got to be comfortable that it's not perfect. You know, as engineers, we tend to have a history of trying to be you know overly precise. You know, the you know we talk about five nines. You know, 99.9999% you know reliability when we're talking about systems. So you don't need to be that precise. So great enterprise architects have learned to manage those tendencies, you know, to not be too precise. I mean, I'm an engineer, I used to design, you know, combat systems for submarines, right? You know, these things can't fail, okay? So I've learned to relax that, um, that pedantic, that, um, that accuracy, that precision, to be able to make a recommendation that's good enough. You know, it's good enough. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to enable a business person to make a decision. 
okay? You can talk confidence levels. Now you can talk about being, you know, X percent confident of your recommendation, and that's okay. Because if you need to be more accurate and more precise, then you can spend some more time and refine your analysis. But remember that time to value. You've got to get some answer very quickly within weeks. So you're never going to get a 99.99% you know, .99 right answer within a couple of weeks. So you're aiming for something less than that. Now, any of you with a project management background will recognize this holy trinity, you know, the quality, time, cost trade-off, because you can't have everything. You know, something's going to give. Okay, so if someone wants very high quality, then you're going to have to spend a lot of time and probably a lot of money to get it. Okay, if you're willing to sacrifice um, a bit of quality, of course you can spend less time and less cost doing that. Now, if you've only got a certain amount of time, then you'll only be able to get a certain amount of quality. And people need to um, you know, accept this, and I'm sure they do, but we as the, you know, the trusted advisors, we need to be evangelical about this and say, look, I'll give you the answer within the time limit you've given me, but I'm going to caveat it with some confidence level. Okay? Our experience, we've seen that, you know, I've certainly seen good architects are ones who can give you the sort of 80, 90 percent accurate kind of answer, and this is a bit of a gut feel. You know, they're saying, look, it's 80, 90 percent accurate with the amount of time you've given me and the budget you've given me, and that's usually good enough for business to make decisions. Okay, so it's a bit of a magic number there, that 85. Um, because absolutely, if you're going to go 95 percent confidence, you'll probably take too long, and you've been too precise. Okay, so, so you know, have that kind of stop point when you think you're about 80 percent right, put it back to the business and say, look, I'm with about 80% confidence, I think this. Is that sufficient confidence for you guys or do you want me to do some more work to come up with a, um, a more accurate answer? Okay. Um, secret number four. Right, so what we're looking at here is, is absolutely, again, this timeliness dimension. So good enterprise architects meet the objectives in the short term, so they're very tactical, but also in the long term, so being strategic. And it's about floating between those two, knowing when you need to give a tactical answer to help a business make an immediate decision versus working more in the background or having some things that are bubbling along a little bit more slowly that are more strategic. Because remember, you still can't have this you know, kind of black hole where you disappear for you know, six months to do some analysis piece. You need to be returning tactical advice very quickly. Okay. Now, usually when we're talking about this and making recommendations into the future, tactically and strategic, the obvious word comes up, roadmap. Okay. Now, um, I've done presentations indeed before for the open group all about roadmapping and how a um, framework like TOGAF supports that. So certainly if anyone wants to find out in depth what roadmapping is all about, there's, there's whole slide decks and webinars out there that people can go and grab. Again, I can, I can give you the slide deck or give you the link to the, to the webinar before about roadmapping in detail. But yeah, I've just got a slide here to, to sort of summarize roadmapping and how does that sort of fit into this, you know, top enterprise architects being tactical or strategic. There is nothing wrong with making a simple roadmap like that picture on the left there. And again, I'm not sure if you can read it on the, the screens you've got, but I can send you these slides and, and you'll have it. That's a business capability model. Okay, it's just showing a heat map here. And it's showing, in this case, it might be showing the future investment plans for the different capabilities. It might be showing the risk against each of those capabilities. It might be showing how much change are we expecting in each of those capabilities. So again, you're just using metrics to overlay onto, uh, in this case, a capability map to show some future. So it is still a roadmap. You're still talking about the future. The one thing that people can agree about with road mapping is it's got some statement about the future. But all you're doing here is actually communicating a position or a what. You're saying what is going to change. You're not saying when, you're not saying how, you're not saying why, you're not saying who's going to be working on it, you know, Roger Kipling's six thinking hats. It's just what's going to be changed. Okay? And absolutely though, that is a very good tactical piece of advice that you can produce for a business stakeholder. They're hopefully going to ask why and how and justify that and you know and, and you know they're going to test you on it. But as a starting point, it's something you can pull together very quickly. It's something that you can present certainly within a week or two of working in, in an area. You can look at the different areas and you can start to make statements about the future of that area. Okay, a very tactical roadmap, just overlaying a heat map 
onto, in this case, a business capability map. It could be on a you know, technical services reference model or a business service model or you know, any other different sort of um, maps that are out there. But you know, this one, a, a capability map overlay is fine. Now, as you move into being more strategic or more sophisticated, there is, of course, any number of approaches to road mapping. And again, I've presented these in depth before, so I'm not going to go into them um, here. But absolutely, when you want to start giving longer range or starting to say when a thing is going to happen, why a thing is going to happen, who is going to be working on these things, you're talking about some more sophisticated roadmaps. Okay? You're looking at timelines and life cycles. You're looking at enterprise roadmaps. You're looking at all these different techniques to show you impact analysis and you know, cause and effect and dependency modeling and all these different approaches to start to talk about more, sorry, more strategically what is going to happen and when and why and, and how and who and all that sort of stuff. This is where you start talking about what um, TOGAF calls an architecture landscape, okay, which is essentially a collection of architectures in your repository where you're talking about multiple potential future states, doing gap analysis and trade-off analysis between them. You're exploring and modeling different futures and you're trading them off against each other and you're using that whole analytic approach to set your roadmap. Okay, so you're modeling future states. Absolutely, that's what you could be doing, but it's not the sort of thing you're going to pull out in a week. Okay, you need to allow a bit more time for that, and it needs to be a more strategic approach when you're looking at some of the more high-risk, high-return, hopefully, strategies that a business is asking you to, to analyze. Okay, um, if we move on to secret number five. Okay, so top enterprise architects find solutions to impossible problems. Okay. Too often we hear that you know, enterprise architects are the, you know, the no police or you know, they, they stop. You know, they're the people that often you don't want to go and talk to because you're afraid, you know, the business doesn't want to talk to you because they're afraid they're going to say no. Okay. So I've got a sort of a little, a little sort of, you know, kind of thing for you here. So it's going to be difficult because I know that um, obviously it's not interactive. You guys can't shout out. Um, so I'm just curious, though, in your own mind, see if you recognize who that is. I mean, I've, I've chosen this carefully for the chance that maybe you won't. Um, Okay, I'll give you a second to think about that. All right, now let's see if any of you got it. It's Jeff Bezos. Okay, now Jeff Bezos you would all know as being the head of Amazon. Okay, this, this picture is from his high school yearbook, so he still had hair. Um, every other photo you'll find after that, he, he didn't have hair. <laughs> so I knew you would have guessed who it was um, if I used one of those. Anyway, Jeff Bezos. So imagine this scenario now. You work in Amazon. Okay, you know Amazon started in 1995. It was a you know, book company. It's where you could buy all the books um, and all that sort of stuff. And it's obviously you know, done a fair bit of damage to the you know, Main Street, High Street booksellers. Um, needed to say, imagine you're working there in the year is 2005. Jeff walks into your office or the CIO walks into your office. You know, you're the lead enterprise architect. And he says, I've got an idea. I want to be the number one infrastructure service provider in the world within 10 years. And you're thinking, what? We're a book company. What on earth are you talking about? Okay. Imagine that was the scenario. Okay. Now, we all know how that story turned out. We know Amazon Web Services now. We know actually it is the number one web services provider or infrastructure service provider in the world. It's a $7 billion a year business. Okay. It's far more than Amazon makes selling books. Okay. So just think though, just think what it would have been like when you were, you know, imagine you were in that office when that request came through. As an enterprise architect, what would you have said? Would you have gone, well, that's just crazy. You know, it, it's, a, you know, it's a complete pivot that is not, you know, I don't think the word pivot even really existed 10 years ago, but it's a pivot of a business that you, know, you would never have expected to come your way. But were you going to be the no police? You know, would you have just said, no, that's crazy. I'm not even going to analyze that. You've got to learn to just be, yeah, okay, all ideas are good ideas. You know, we start talking about, you know, that whole, um, you know, innovation side of things. You know, all ideas are good ideas, okay? You should explore every idea, analyze every idea on its merit. You know, our job as enterprise architects is to do the analysis, present the findings, you know, whether it's for or against. We're just making a recommendation. We're, remember, we're a trusted advisor. We're just making a recommendation to say, yeah, look, we think if we did that, this will be the consequences. You know, so it's that kind of cost-benefit analysis piece that we should be doing as enterprise architects. Because absolutely, some ideas completely coming from the left field could be the right thing to do. Exactly that case with Amazon Web Services, right? So there's no problem with, with you know, people throwing great ideas into the mix 
we as architects should analyze them. We shouldn't analyze every idea, of course. You know, there should be some sort of gated process, you know, some sort of threshold by which we, we throw our analytic skills at it. But nonetheless, we should be open to any type of idea and we should be doing the analysis in a timely nature. So remember, time to value, you know, providing some insight as quick as we can. And who knows what the answer is going to be? Who knows what the decision is going to be? Okay, I've been involved in you know, major procurement projects where, you know, uh, you know, a client was looking at you know, option A versus option B, and you know, I would do the piece of work, and you know, we're talking billions of dollars, right? I would do the piece of work that would, would you know, make a recommendation, and absolutely they would sometimes choose the other one. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, when we're making our recommendations, we are just one opinion amongst many opinions. You know, you'd all know about your, your PESL analysis and things like that. You know, there, there could have been a political motivation for it. There could have been a legal motivation for it or a socio-technical motivation. Just because it's the best technical solution, which is typically what we'll, we'll do our analysis around, doesn't mean it's the best one for an organisation. We're just one voice um, in the decision making process. Okay, um, the last secret here, secret number six, top enterprise architects quantify risks. Okay, so this is where we really get into the whole metrics world, okay, because all of the things before I've been talking about, you know, you can do a heat map and show the areas that are risky or show the areas that are going to change or show the areas that are, um, you know, have got the most, you know, kind of compliance or something like that. That could just be low, medium, high. You know, it doesn't have to be, uh, you, know, a, you know, five decimal places, remember, you know, don't confuse precision with accuracy, right? So absolutely, though, when you start to want to have deeper and more trusted conversations, you need to start to basically quantify these things. Okay? When we start to look at how quantification is done, there really turns out to be about four different ways or four different types of metrics you can look at. Okay? So these are different when you get into the algorithms that you're going to run and the different approaches you're going to use to you know, come up with numbers and make you know, some sort of quantitative recommendations. You've got to pigeonhole and think about these four different types of, of metrics you're going to look at. So, Certainly there are just direct metrics. So these are ones that are you know, survey based or you, you, know, you pull them in from some you know, third party repository. They're just things like your know, number of users or you know, they're just very you know, kind of data point based things. You know, it's just a number or it's just a pick list. You know, it's just something you've chosen as a direct measure. Okay, they then are what we refer to as associated measures. So really what you're doing is taking one of those direct measures but then you're associating it or reasoning about it in a different part of your business. Okay? So for example, you might know the end of life date for a standard. Okay? So that's a direct measure on a standard, but the fact that that standard is associated with, I don't know, let's say an application, then you now can infer the end of life date for that application. So that's an associated measure of the application as a direct measure of the standard. Okay, now you would know in, in TOGAF there's the whole standards information base, the SIB. This is a pretty classic application of associated measures. Then you start looking at summary measures. Okay, summary measures are essentially rolling up the hierarchy or aggregating things. So you might be saying that, you know, let's say the end of life date there is, you know, on all the different standards um, that go towards producing maybe a capability. Well, an aggregated measure would be the earliest of those end of life dates. Okay, so you're starting to do minimum, maximum, average, sum, count, you know, all these different traditional aggregated measures and you know, maybe coming up with percents, you know, when you're talking average, you know, maybe the average number of users is you know, 56, maybe the average criticality is 3 out of 5, you know, these classic summary measures which are using a, you know, leveraging that aggregated nature of, of relationships. And then, of course, there's the whole calculated or simulated based ones. So these are much more formulaic. You, know, you might be taking, you know, A plus B divided by 26 times 5. You know, all the different algorithms you have out there in the world for, you know, doing discounted cash flow or different regulatory um, calculations and compliance calculations. So all the different formulas you would normally think of. Okay. And a quick little example of how that might sort of play together. Imagine you're sort of thinking about your business like this. You've got on the left there a bit of a capability kind of decomposition, so a, you know, a functional decomposition of capabilities made up of you know, applications made up of modules or something like that. On the right, you've got you know, a more geographic, you know, physical kind of um, view of your business where you're talking about the different regions that you operate in and the different buildings or locations and what physical assets they might have in them. Okay? So you know, computers and whatever data centers, rooms and stuff like that. 
Okay, so when you're looking at these things together, there's relationships that go across these hierarchy as well. So, you know, an application may run on something at a location or a module may actually be running on a given physical server or something like that. So, we might be able to come up with a direct measure on that physical server, okay? So, we might know its cost. You know, maybe it's, it's supplied to us by a third-party provider and they tell us it's, you know, 3,000 pounds a year or something, you know, back to the Amazon, you know, world of thinking, okay? So, we have a direct measure on that server. Well, we can aggregate that measure with its other peers up the hierarchy to come up with a measure at the country. Now, this shouldn't be anything you know, mysterious to you. It's obviously just positioning it into a bit of a taxonomy. So now we can understand the aggregated measure or the summary measure of all of the things within a given region or something like that. That's a classic aggregation. But we can now associate this measure across relationships. So we now might have some view of what the cost for a given capability might be. So again, we can look at the cost of the modules, the cost of the applications, and then aggregate that. Okay, so we might understand, for example, the cost of each capability due to the physical assets that are required to deliver it. And of course, maybe the people and the you know, other aspects that are um, required to deliver a capability. But this approach of quantifying things and using different metrics and different methodologies to reason about them absolutely allows you to put some quantification around the risks that you're doing or indeed the options you're exploring in a business. Okay. And that fits within this kind of realm of four different types of roadmap. And again, I, I'm just touching on this. There's a whole you know, presentation I've done previously about this that goes into these in detail. I've even shown you a couple of these roadmaps before. So I don't want to go into these too much. But basically, you're using these metrics at each stage in here. If you remember that heat map that was showing the, the, you know, the colors on top of the business capability map, well, that was a type one roadmap where we were using an aggregated measure Okay, so you understand all those now, and showing it on a business capability map. Okay, if we look at the, the type two, those Lifecycle or Gantt chart ones, that was the classic, you know, road, um, classic roadmap with a, you know, a horizontal bar where the start and end dates are set as something. That might have been using associated end of life dates from the technologies that are required to deliver something. Okay, so that could be using associated metrics. When we start looking at ripple effects or dynamic roadmaps, we're now talking about the dependencies between things. Okay, so we're saying, look, if um, this project is going to deliver this capability by this date, well, this project then can't um, start working until that capability is available. So, you know, when you start doing roadmaps like that, you know, these things start sliding around. And if you put a delay on a project, that of course is going to push out when a given capability that's associated with that is available. Okay. And the, third, sorry, the fourth type of roadmap are these multiple architecture ones. That's the one that I talked about as an architecture landscape from TOGAF. So it's the collection of architectures, the sandboxes of architectures that you're looking at, all the different options you're exploring, and how you can um, reason about those quantitatively, because now you're talking about metrics at the architecture level. Option A, you know, architecture option A, where we're planning to you know, rationalize these things, outsource those things, well, that affects you know, metrics X, Y, and Z in this way. Versus option B, where we're looking at doing you know, some consolidation stuff or some you know, specialization stuff, that affects metrics you know, X, Y, and Z in a different way. So again, you're using metrics in each one of these approaches to roadmaps to come up with a reasoned and hopefully quantitative um, story. Okay. Um, now, a bit of a plug, so, so certainly um, I know that obviously Simon framed it, you know, so I work for a company, Evolution Software, I'm also a researcher um, at a university, so the company, Evolution, has this product, Abacus, and so absolutely all the stuff I'm talking about here, you can do using Abacus Cloud, it's all in the web, you can manage all these roadmaps, you know, you can all collaborate them all around the world in real time, it's all, all pretty cool stuff, but yeah, I don't want to do a, a software plug today. Um, there's my contact details. Um, again, I said I'll provide these slides, that's fine, so just reach out to me on that email address there or drop Simon an email and um, he can provide you these slides as well. This is going to be recorded, so it has been recorded hopefully, so we can um, obviously Simon will provide you the link to all of these um, slides and my commentary. And as a final thing, um, we're going to be at the Austin event um, in a couple of weeks' time. I'll be there. So I'll be able to show you Archimate 3, um, Abacus supports Archimate 3, so I'll be able to show you all the work there. And of course, we've supported TOGAF for many years. So absolutely, if you'd like to continue the conversation face-to-face, -face, I look forward to seeing any of you there in Austin.
But otherwise, um, Simon, I guess back to you. And yeah, if there's any questions in the, the, the Q&A um, window, I'm happy to take them now. If anyone's got any questions to throw into the, uh, throw them into the Q&A window. And if I don't get time to get through them today, then um, yeah, we should certainly be able to take them offline as well.